On this episode of Today's Shopsmith, we're getting ready for a summer of project building and an upcoming road trip. We'll make sure our equipment is checked out, tuned up, and ready to hit the road. We'll also be building a backyard project the entire family will enjoy all summer long. You're not going to want to miss any of this one. Well, as you can see, we made it through what seemed to be an exceptionally long winter. Uh, you saw we had budding trees, now we got green grass. It's a long ways from the snow that was out there. Not all that long ago, but we're now about two or three weeks into a spring. Great time to get out in the shop, take a look at the machinery, get it ready for some uh, heavy use this summer. Of course, any time your machine has sat dormant for any length of time at all, it's probably going to need some maintenance. It could be something as simple as uh, just checking the cord, most of the plug and inside, uh, tightening up uh, uh, fasteners that may have vibrated loose, that happens uh, quite often, or maybe more extensive maintenance like uh, putting oil in your oil ports, checking the belts. All this stuff is covered in great detail, of course, in your owner's manual, and owner's manuals have always come with the shopsmith. But nobody reads owner's manuals anymore, so we have the internet. But beware, you never know what you might find there. With five precision tools in one compact unit, the Mark V makes it easy and affordable for anyone to get the most out of wood. Hi, I'm Brian Keller. Like millions of people, I've recently rediscovered woodworking. It made me realize what's missing in our hectic and high-pressured lives. Maybe you've noticed it too. It's the pride and satisfaction you get in creating something with your own hands. Woodworking is also a great way to save money on home improvements and make money in your spare time. Let me introduce you to someone who will really inspire you. This is Mike Young. He works for ShopSmith and is a master woodworker. <laughs> well, as you just saw, there's some things on the internet that were never intended to be on the internet. But that was, was our old uh, uh, infomercial filmed in 1993. We must have ran that for 10 or 15 years in a market that we uh, were going to go into and do a, a mall event or a home show affair or something like that. But that was strictly for TV. But now you can watch that kind of stuff all day long on the internet. So my only word of caution is when it's talking about trying to find information about the shopsmith, how to do things on the shopsmith, how to maintain the shopsmith, uh, you, know, you, you gotta kinda use your brains. Pick out the, the folks that you think are credible, find some folks that uh, you think they, they know what they're talking about. Uh, better yet, find professionals. Uh, find people that have worked with shopsmith for many, many years, like Doug Reed, that's a good uh, resource. Uh, those kind of people, when they post things, you can count on being fairly accurate and most of the time fairly complete. Of course, there's lots of videos on YouTube that'll tell you how to wax this up. Take a look at this. This machine's been sitting about two months. And although it might have looked good on the surface, whoa. Look at the black on that. That's just smut and oxidation from the air and from sitting. That makes a big difference when you get that all cleaned up. Of course, your weight tubes are always the no-brainer. You want those things waxed up frequently. Same way. But you wouldn't believe how many times I have people come up to me like at a live event that say, Mike, I've waxed and waxed my machine over and over and over. And from day one, the headstock has never seemed to slide or glide as effortlessly as yours. Well, if you're one of those that's actually waxed and waxed and waxed, maybe you need to go to the next step. And that's dialing in your tubes. Most people have never heard of dialing in your tubes. This is the kind of stuff you can't find on the internet. That's one of my problems with the internet. Dialing in your weight tube starts with loosening a few parts and pieces. This machine has a lift assist on it, so we need to loosen the eight bolts that hold the upper bracket on. Don't have to remove it, just loosen it. Of course, we'll need to loosen the weight tubes as well. To 
depending on how old your machine is, you loosen the two set screws that hold the wave tubes to the castings, both on the left side and the right side. On new machines, they're right here uh, on top of the casting, like this one. Uh, older machines, uh, you're gonna have to access them from underneath. So you need to raise the machine up into drill press mode, and you can get to those set screws pretty easily then. Make sure that the uh, carriage is unlocked and the headstock is unlocked. So once everything is unlocked, I'm gonna put a little mark with a felt pen on each one of these tubes. Can you see that? Because when everything's loose, you can now literally turn the tube, dial them in. You want to turn eighth at a time. Run both the headstock and the carriage down the rails. You got an area that binds, keep trying to dial it in until you spend enough time dialing this in, you'll notice that the bind is gone, or your headstock just seems to move that much better. Now make sure once you're done dialing in your weight tubes, you lock everything back down. Make sure these weight tubes are locked on each end, the two set screws on each end. If you've uh, disconnected or loosened your uh, lift assist, lock that back down. We don't want any surprises down the road. Once that's complete, you've done a checkup and a tune-up, you're ready to start building projects. And that's what we're gonna do here. Today's Shopsmith with Michael Young is the show dedicated to the do-it-yourselfer, hobbyist, and shopsmith enthusiast. Every episode is filled with advice and practical tips and techniques for maximizing your woodworking results. See how to improve your projects both large and small by increasing your tools capabilities while improving your woodworking skills, skills that lead to quality and results. Visit today's Shopsmith with Michael Young, watch an episode, and then subscribe to this channel. Subscribers are always the first to see the latest trends in woodworking for the home hobbyist, up-to-date information that can impact your woodworking results, as well as practical woodworking solutions for your home workshop. In addition, subscribers are the first to be introduced to the newest Shopsmith innovations, products, and inside information about everything Shopsmith. Don't miss a single episode of today's Shopsmith with Michael Young. Subscribe today, and remember, your satisfaction is always guaranteed. You know, spring and summer is really one of the best times of the year to get out there and do something on our machines. Uh, lots of different types of projects for uh, springtime and summertime. Uh, we found something that seems to be one of the hottest things across the country lately. It's really taken hold, in other words. Kind of started out in the Midwest. Actually, a little uh, argument there. Did it start in Ohio, specifically Cincinnati, or was it down in Kentucky? Uh, one thing for certain, its actual origins date all the way back to the 18th century. This is where uh, a farmer, Kupperman I think his name was, was watching some kids throw rocks and trying to hit it into a gopher hole. That was the very first cornhole game. So we're gonna take some time, we're gonna build a, a pair of cornhole boards and uh, we're gonna give them away to a family that spends an awful lot of time out in their own backyard and I think they're gonna enjoy this all summer long. So as usual, I hit the internet myself and just typed in cornhole boards and boy, you're not gonna believe what's available. Uh, hundreds of different kinds of designs, really artistic uh, finished products. We found one that actually gave us the uh, regulation uh, measurements and scales and that's the one we're gonna work from. So the building materials list on this uh, cornhole board plan isn't really all that extensive. You're gonna need two pieces of two foot wide, four foot long plywood. And you need uh, about 40 feet of one by three select pine. That's what I'm gonna use select because it's straight again. I used that earlier. Uh, so not a lot there. I guess the first thing we'll do is we'll uh, set up to cut that plywood. Speaking of that, uh, again, if you get on the internet, you'll see uh, a lot of people talking about how you can use your shop to cut plywood. But to my knowledge, I'm still the only one to actually show cutting full sheets of plywood on the shopsmith. 
Obviously, setting up the tables is pretty key if you're gonna cut full sheets. Notice what I've done here. I've created a, an outfeed table with one of my floaters. Then I'll simply measure out what I need from the tooth of my blade to the fence. And then, keeping my eye on the fence, not on the blade, I simply feed the material through the blade. It really is that simple. Give it a try sometime, you'll like it. The frame requires uh, four four foot lengths and four two foot lengths. I'm changing it up a little bit by shortening each one of those dimensions by one and a half inches because I want to put a hardwood band around the exposed plywood. I mean, these are going to be in the outdoor, so I think it adds just a little bit more protection. To get my exact four foot lengths, I'm using a stop block attached to my fence, and I'm measuring from the stop block out four feet to a tooth on my blade. Once you do that, you can do as many four foot lengths as you want. Another great way to get exact cuts repetitively is go out and build yourself a jig like this. This is called a miter gauge extension with an adjustable stop block. These, of course, you can make about any length you want. I've got three of these. This is for my shorter pieces. You measure one time from the tooth of your blade out to where you need. In this case, it was like 22 and a half inches. Lock it once. Over and over and over, you get exactly what you want. If you are going to make jigs and fixtures, it's always a good idea to use good solid core plywood like this Baltic birch. It's stable, it won't change shape, and it won't warp on you. This particular jig is pretty simple really to build. It's a three and a half inch wide piece of material cut to the length that you want with a three and a half inch square stop block. There's also three countersunk holes drilled into it. Two for mounting the jig to the miter gauge and one for the stop block. The fun part is routing the slot for the stop block itself. This is the real advantage of having an overhead router. You get to see your starting point and your stopping point. You want to take multiple passes. By taking multiple light passes, you end up with a real clean, real straight through cut. You can find this very jig and many other jigs and fixtures in your Power Tool Woodworking for Everyone book. This has got to be the finest resource for learning how to use the machine. It walks you through specific operations using every function of the mark, as well as most accessories. And as a bonus, it does include plans and measurements for building many, many jigs and fixtures. You'll want to reference this as often as you can. Well, I've got the four foot pieces cut and the two foot pieces cut for the frame, plus a support piece that goes down the middle. Now I need to cut four legs, but on each end, I need to put a radius around over here. So that's what I'm getting ready to cut now on the bandsaw. And something like these legs where I got this round over, like I say, I take them over to the bandsaw and rough cut them. But to really get them perfect, I'll always use my disc sander and sand it right to where I need it to be. Dead on. Of course, every time I use my disc sander when I'm done, I always make sure I refresh my disc by using my abrasive cleaning stick. I've got all the pieces cut and shaped. Now it's just a matter of assembling some frames and we'll take it from there. Assembly started by me cutting screw pockets on the inside of each of the frame pieces. I wanted to use screw pockets so I didn't have to go through the top. I wanted a flat flush surface. Then assembling the frame was just uh, one and a half inch wood screws, countersunk, and then filled with the uh, dowel plugs. 
After trimming those off, I made sure both frames were sounded well all the way around. These are going to be visible. And after that, it was just a matter of using glue and screws to the pockets to attach the frames to the top. After the glue set, I went ahead and drilled holes through all four legs in the frames. Uh, the holes are for the hardware I'll be using, which is two and a half inch long, five sixteenths uh, carriage bolts. Well, our boards are basically done, but it is missing one major component, and that's the hole. A couple ways you can do that, you can take out your compass, draw the six inch hole, six inches regulation, drill a starter hole here, and cut it out with your saber saw. Take a little while, if you're careful, you can cut it fairly round, hit it with sandpaper to finish it out. What I'm going to use is something I found on Amazon, and this is this monster six inch hole saw cutter. I'm afraid this is an example of uh, you get what you pay for. This was a $16 cutter, like I said, from Amazon. Most of the time these kind of cutters sell for 55, 65 bucks, and it really gave me some fits. Eventually I figured out I had to cut real, real slow. Well, after I cut the holes, I actually did hit the holes with a roundover bit. Now I'm just sanding the inside, cleaning it up a little bit. Do the same thing on the other and boards are ready to start adding some finish. Well, I put three coats of a, a water-based polyacrylic on these things, and uh, they look good. All the joints are good because they use some good uh, material. A lot of people would go with that right there because we could start playing right now. What I wanted to do, though, was take it up a notch. So I found these uh, vinyl wraps that are made specifically for cornhole boards that I try my hand at that. The key here is you want to be real, real careful and take your time laying these in. The trick here is getting it started straight. I got some lines kind of marked up here. It will hopefully Help me out here this first start here. Once you get it started, it's not too bad. You gotta watch for bubbles. And you go slow. Just peel the backing off three or four inches at a time at most. That's not good having wind. If you do have a problem, it does pop up fairly easily. Relay it. Get those bubbles out. To do the hole, you're going to flip the board over, then with a nice sharp X-Acto knife, you're going to trim out the center of that hole, leaving about an inch, inch and a half uh, reveal there. Then you just simply flip the board back over. Now with a hair dryer, I'm going to heat the vinyl up around that hole. Doesn't take very long for it to get hot, but you got to have it nice and warm to soften the vinyl. Then you just slowly work the vinyl down into the hole, over the edge. You can feel the vinyl softening up. It makes it pretty easy to conform to different shapes. See how that's working? That's what you want. Well, there they are, 
two regulation vinyl wrapped cornhole boards ready for play, which is exactly what we're going to do right after this. Well, I'm packing up and getting ready for a cross-country road trip. I'm heading to Dayton, Ohio and a visit to the factory, then it's on into Chicago. Along the way though, I'd like to visit some of you. If you have a shop space you'd like to share with our viewers, you'd like to show us your shopsmith setup and maybe even some of your favorite projects, and be featured in an upcoming episode of today's Shopsmith, this is your opportunity. Drop me a line at myoung at shopsmith.com, tell me you'd like me to stop by, include a photo of your shop space if you can, and we'll be in touch. I can only do just a few of you, so you want to respond early. We'll contact you and arrange an exact date and time for our visit. I'll bring the coffee and some great gifts for your Shopsmith. You supply the workspace, the equipment, and we'll spend some real quality time talking all Shopsmith. Again, if you want me to stop by, email me at mmyoung at shopsmith.com and I'll see you this summer. Well, as promised, we went ahead and delivered the uh, two cornhole boards to the uh, family we talked about earlier. And to say the least, they were nothing short but being real excited. So we set the boards up in the backyard and the two boys in the family, they took to this like ducks in water. In fact, Tyler, he was a natural. He was scoring every time he tossed a bag. Karsten, God love him, he had his own unique throwing style. We call it the full body technique. But for whatever reason, he seemed to make it work. What a great shot. So out of the goodness of my heart, I thought, well, I'll show you the right way to do it. Now notice the stance, wonderful backswing fluid forward motion into a full extension follow through. Wait for it, wait for it, hit, slide, and in. Three points. That's the way to do it. I'm Michael Young and I'll see you next time on today's Shopsmith.